Well, there are lots of things I could mention, but I'm just going to talk about two. Oh, hello. Is that better? Do you want me to stand up? Yes. Okay. There are lots of things I could mention, but I'm just going to say two. The first one is that staying in Europe, I think, is the best hope for democracy. And why do I think that? I, because democracy is not just about elections. Democracy is about being able to influence the decisions that affect your lives. And all of us know at the moment that we have a fantastic democratic deficit. We cannot influence the decisions that affect our lives. Why can't we? Well, it's partly globalization. It's partly because the decisions are taken in the headquarters of multinational corporations, on the laptops of financial whiz kids in the global financial market. And in my view, the only way we can take back to those kinds of decisions is through being in an organization large enough to do it, and that's the European Union. But the other reason is Britain. Um, the reason we don't have democracy here is partly because of lots of the things people said this morning. The role of the city, the role of the financial class, the role of the tabloid press. It's partly because of the technology of elections, which completely marginalised genuine public debate. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned is that it's the deep state, the legacy of imperialism, the legacy of the Cold War, surveillance and all of those things, which is very deep in our state. And so for all those reasons, I think if we voted to come out, uh, we would be a very nasty, authoritarian, neoliberal country. Now, the second reason is something that actually hasn't been discussed at all in this in this uh, debate, and that's to do with the EU as an institution. It's not a state, whatever Boris Johnson says. It's a multilateral organization that's a bit deeper and has more connections and has majority voting, is a bit more than other multilateral organizations, and that's the sort of organization we need for the 21st century. And I'm very involved in security issues, and that's something that is not discussed at all. The EU's security policy is about contributing to peacekeeping. It's about being part of the United, strengthening the United Nations. And in a moment, uh, you know, people don't know that, for instance, the Palestinian Authority is completely financed by the European Union. <laughs> So the European Union has actually quite a progressive. There have been 30 missions under UN mandates, EU missions. And it's very imperfect, and I could go on at length about what's wrong with it. But nevertheless, I think if we're going to cope with the sorts of conflicts we see in Syria and Libya, that kind of security policy is really needed. Now, the our campaign goes on about building a European army. It is not a Euro European army. What Mogherini, who is a, the new high representative, wants is something very different. She wants a civ mill headquarters. That means civilians in control for these kind of peacekeeping and humanitarian missions. And I, at the moment, she's undertaking a global review. And I really hope that will make that aspect of the European Union stronger. Thanks, thanks, Mary. And you get your water now. Um, we're going to hear next from James. James, what gives you hope and what should we build? No, you, you, get, you get one minute now to do that. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> well, the, that's fine. I can do it in one minute. I think what's so exciting about today is that it's the beginning of a new pan-European movement. And I'm so happy that Yanis Varoufakis is here. And I think his DM25 uh, initiative provides us with an umbrella for all these kinds of movements across Europe. And, that's the only, and that will enable us to build a different kind of Europe. What kind of Europe? Well, I said it's a multinational 21st century institution. My idea is that it should be a kind of model of global governance in which it taxes global bads like multinational corporations or financial speculation or carbon emissions and promotes global goods like 
um, peacekeeping, uh, energy efficiency, redistribution, uh, youth employment, and that and. In that way, it doesn't itself become an, a state. Rather, it enables us to have democracy at local level much closer to the citizen. It protects us from the global bads that prevent us from being democratic at local levels. So that's my conception of what we should build with this new movement. Uh, rooms like this um, give me hope, and we're seeing more and more of them uh, rising people coming together, organising and challenging power in all sorts of ways. And you know, we've not won yet, and we're we're winning a little bit, and things are very difficult. But people are being are able to organise now more than they have done for perhaps 20 years. We, I was in uh, America last month looking at the the Bernie Sanders campaign. And they've got half a million people, they had half a million people, activists volunteering for them, pretty much self-organised, pretty much entirely led by ordinary people, by volunteers, giving the time that they can. They made three million phone calls in the three days before the New York State primary. Three million phone calls. If we can organise in that same way, we can. And we saw a little bit of it. Last summer, I was able to see a little bit of last summer because Paul might be very kind and say that I uh, helped Jeremy Corbyn get elected. I, I didn't. 17,000 volunteer activists helped Jeremy Corbyn get elected. And that's from the smallest, you know, in the context of last summer, that's from the smallest possible thing, like sitting down with, uh, with your workmates and saying, please, you know, he's our guy, he's going to help text support to whatever it was, 8776, whatever, and pay three quid and come and support him. Or many more things, organising phone banks, flyering, knocking on doors, having conversations with people. And um, you know, this isn't new. It's not new. It's not like suddenly people coming together, this is the first time it's happened. I mean, like Marcus Garvey organised 11 million people across four continents without the internet, without even a decent you know, mail service. So it's not new, but this is a moment where it's rising. It's a moment where it's rising when three things come together, we see these big, these big possible upsurges. The first one is technology that is enabling. That's not just sort of little digital tools, although those are incredibly important, but it's also social and political technologies. Us uh, having the idea that we can be in charge and that we can empower others to be in charge and that we don't have to be told what to do from above and we can organise ourselves and we can set our own, uh, our own parameters. The second thing is when people have a cause or they're really pissed off. And like right now, lots of people, quite rightly, are really pissed off. And that is being channeled. That needs to be channeled and it is being channeled and people are working that out together. And then the third thing is political institutions, either old ones or new ones, that enable people to go and get organised. So things like Another Europe is Possible here, that came together in, what, the first meeting was February? September. Launched in February? And now we're, what, May? And this is all going on, and it's about to get much, 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 much bigger. So what should we, what should we build? We should build things which, in a, which push and increase those th three things which come together. So we should uh, build the technologies, both digital technologies and social technologies and political technologies that enable us to go and organise. So when you have your breakout meetings later on today, when between three and four, when you sit around and work out what are you going to do after today, how do you do it, look around the other people that you're, that you're there with and uh, tell them what you're going to do and listen to what they're going to do and organise with them. The second thing is the cause. We need to build the cause. This is why another Europe is so, uh, is so important. Another Europe is possible is so important. Because we're, we, we don't want the, the, the Stronger In campaign. We don't want their project fa fear. We don't buy it. It doesn't speak to us. It doesn't inspire us. Because it's essentially trying to support the status quo. And we don't want to support the status quo. We want to be in Europe to radically change it. And the third thing is 
it within the, our institutions, where, wherever we are. So for me, that's momentum of the Labour Party, trying to make those as much as possible, things which enable people so they can go and act, so that people can organise their own events like this and take their political activism to a completely other level to organise for another society, for another Europe. Thanks. Hello everybody, thanks for having me to speak today and thank you all of you for coming and um, I think it falls to me as the Another Europe representative here to thank DM for being involved today, uh, for joining us, thank you Yanis for being here and I think what it brings... <laughs> I think, I think what DM is really bringing today is this sense of a vision for the Europe that we actually want. Something that's been completely missing from the EU referendum campaign on either side, uh, as far as I've been able to see, is any kind of vision for something worth fighting for. Um, this campaign is going to outlast beyond, I hope, a Remain vote in the EU referendum to carry on and continue to work for a more democratic Europe. And that's what gives me hope, that we'll stand up with a critical Remain campaign, one that was so sorely needed in this country, and with an inspiring vision. And more than being needed just in the EU referendum campaign, I think a bit of inspiration is actually needed in the EU, because... Uh, I am one of those people who never would have come about genetically if the EU didn't exist, so I've always been somewhat on side, but um, I have to say I can't remember the last time I was inspired by anything that the EU came out with, I don't know about you. Um, so this movement, this movement really is something inspirational, something that we can bring to change it into what we want from Europe. Um, and to move away from this crisis, this European crisis, which isn't just an economic crisis, it's a moral crisis. Um, in my day job, when I'm not with another Europe, I'm a refugee and migrants' rights campaigner. So I know all about this moral crisis, moral failure to respond as Europe should to the refugee crisis. <laughs> and I think that this is relevant. It's not just me trying to talk about what I know about. I think that it is relevant because I think that the way that EU leaders have handled, or rather failed to handle, the refugee crisis has been fundamentally dishonest. We have been told that there is no money and that we cannot take these people in, we cannot provide for them, that they are a strain. We have been told that Greece has to take responsibility even though Greece has its own crisis and it's obviously incapable of coping with the numbers arriving on its shores. And we have been told that that is their fault. And yet for 15 years we've had a set of laws that have not been applied in Greece, a set of standards that should have been applied for human rights, basic dignity for refugees, and we didn't enforce those. What has been the priority has not been enforcing human rights and decent living standards for all. The priority has been dirty, I should say filthy, deals being made behind closed doors with no scrutiny between the EU and third countries to keep migrants away. You've probably all heard of the EU-Turkey deal. Well, that's just the latest in a long, long line of deals where our money has been spent on funding corrupt regimes to lock up and torture their citizens so that they never make it to our shores to claim their right to asylum. And this is relevant because every time a decision is made to fund detention centers in Sudan, and we are funding surveillance equipment and detention centers in Sudan, the decision is made not to fund pensioners in Spain. Every time the decision is made to build a fence, it is made not to pay to build our communities. And we need to have our voices heard as European citizens when those decisions are being made. We need to open up those doors so that we can make decisions that benefit our communities, that treat people as humans, and that don't fund awful things that fund good things, just as Mary was saying. So, we need, we need a Europe that takes citizen engagement seriously, that allows us to understand how Europe works so that we can influence it. And I think another thing that's come up in the DM manifesto and that's come up again in other speakers today is that talk of local power. And what Europe can do is can devolve power, push power down, 
give it to the regions. Because when people act locally, they act on decisions that affect them, they know about that, they understand that, and it empowers them to then make links across borders and to act on the questions that are bigger and that need to be dealt with on an international scale. So let's forget about this nation state and its sovereignty. Let's talk about localism, regionalism, and internationalism and unity. And finally, that's what I want to build, because much as Greece is a little bit of a dark child of Europe when it comes to refugees, what I did see when I went to volunteer there was something that really inspired me and that I really think we need to build up. And that was ordinary individual peoples, not even NGOs, not the big NGOs and certainly not the state, just ordinary people getting together, forming groups, people from all over the world, not just all over Europe, getting together and showing solidarity with refugees and working on systems that worked to provide immediate relief where it was lacking. And that's what we need to build, that working on refugees, working on all the social issues that we face, people organizing together on a basic level to give us what we need where the politicians don't. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. A new politics, a people's Europe. Yanis. I shall begin by thanking uh, Zoe and the good people uh, in the Another Europe is Possible com campaign, which could also be another kind of politics is possible campaign, another kind of referendum debate is possible campaign. Uh, all these possibilities. Um, I want to, uh, to, to thank Paul for organizing this, this particular session. Let me answer the, Paul's first question. Where does hope come from? Uh, I think it comes from two areas, from two sources. One is faith in an optimistic perspective on human nature, which has nothing to do with evidence. <laughs> and from, as you said, meetings like this, particularly meetings like this in Germany. You can understand where I'm coming from. When we go to Germany, we started DiEM25 in Germany, in Berlin, uh, in February. And when we have meetings like that of German Democrats, comrades, keen to be part of this process of building a democratic Europe and keen to oppose the powers that be in Berlin, in Brussels, in Athens, in London, then I get hope. On the second question, what should we try to build? What am I trying to build? What is the issue at hand? the actual project. I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, you know, I had my watch here, looking out for the five minute the rule, and he overturned it. So he, you, you may live to regret this. <laughs> um, there was a lady in uh, the session this morning who was quite, angry and wanted to have a debate and asked a pertinent question that sounded a bit aggressive, but I believe it was a question that we need to address. She said, okay, all this stuff about democratizing Europe and a democratic Britain embedded in a democratizing Europe is all good and fine and perfect, but how are you going to do it? So I think that I'm going to combine those two questions, Paul's second question with that lady's question. And in particular, she mentioned something which I think is uh, very useful in this context. She mentioned her experiences in a local authority. What was it? The People's Republic of Barnet? <laughs> Barnet. Yes. Yes. Are you here? No. no. From to you are from. I want to say something later. Good. <laughs> I don't know anything about Barnet, <laughs> but. <laughs> the way she described the oligarchy within the local authority uh, and posing the question, okay, so if we have this problem at the level of the local authority, how are we going to democratize Europe? Uh, it, it made me think that uh, this is a very interesting way of approaching the problem at the grand scale of Europe by looking at the relationship between the, lo the, lo the regional, the local, the city, 
the national parliament and Europe. Immediately after some engagements here in, in England and in Wales, I'm going to fly to Barcelona, where with Ada Colau, the mayor of, the magnificent mayor of Barcelona. <laughs> Wednesday, Wednesday. All right, I'll be there on Thursday too. So we'll be there together. <laughs> we are celebrating the, 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 the first, the anniversary of her spectacular victory. Uh, that ushered that, usher that in the city council. Now, what is happening in cities like Barcelona is crucial, and it answers the, to a very large extent the question that uh, this lady asked, your friend from your neighbour from Barnet asked. Uh, take for one example: the the way in which the city's budget is now open to a participatory deliberative democratic process. Jordi Ayala, who is the finance minister in inverted commas of the city of Barcelona, has begun an amazing project of engaging the citizens of Barcelona, the residents of Barcelona, in the process of putting together, through collaborative means, the budget of the city. Doing exactly the opposite of the oligarchic practices of Barnet and of most cities and municipalities around Europe. Now, th these cities, cities like Barcelona, like Valencia, like Madrid, like La, Co La Coruña in Porto Spain, Alegre. Porto Alegre, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Napoli is joining us very soon. Okay, all right. Now, let's not have a, just a long catalog. <laughs> let's just refer to them as rebel cities. They are an essential aspect of the vision that Diem has, and it's inside our manifesto as well, regarding how do we act locally, regionally, nationally, within a democratizing Europe. We are not going to democratize Europe from Brussels. We're going to have to, have to work at all levels at once. So, in response to the question, so what do we do? What are we building? We're building a network of cities, of regions, eventually, governments that will confront the practices of Brussels through what I call governmental disobedience. It's what I tried to do last year, what I did last year, that's why I was not particularly liked in Brussels. <laughs> when inane, unsustainable, impossible to implement rules are the order of the day in Europe, our cities, our municipalities, and our governments have a moral obligation to disobey and to try to change and to democratize the European Union through governmental disobedience. But at the very same time, we have to be able to confront the powers that be in the financial centers in the Wall Street Journal, in the Financial Times, who ask very particular questions such as, okay, and what are you going to do with monetary policy? What are you going to do with the Euro? What are you going to do with the Bank of England? What are you going to do with the low level of investment and negative interest rates? We cannot afford to say, oh, another world is, better, is possible. We have to have policies, and we have to, exp we have to make them feel uncomfortable by presenting them with policies that in their own head sound more plausible than theirs. So what we're trying to build in Diem is a process of putting together white papers, policy papers, on the main issues confronting Europeans. From transparency and migration to the question of economics. And that question of economics that I alluded to, monetary policy, fiscal policy, taxation, and so on and so forth, has, in my view, to fall under the heading, reflecting FDR, of a Green New Deal for Europe that will include the following four chapters or realms. There must be a policy of coordinating our uh, management of Europe's money whether it's the pound or the euro, 
At the moment, we have complete lack of coordination between the Bank of England and the European Central Bank. This is not a clever way of running even capitalism. <laughs> we have a quantitative easing process. We had it here in, in, in England with the Bank of England. Now that has tapered off. It's picking up in Europe, which is completely independent of a process of boosting investment in a continent which is labored under the lowest level of investment since 1945. We have the highest level of savings and the lowest level of investment. So we need to articulate policies, and we are in the process of doing that as DM, uh, for combining and coordinating monetary policies with investment policies through a network of public investment banks, one of them being, of course, the European Investment Bank, which is already there, has alre already has the infrastructure to help, but we need such a public investment bank in Britain, and Jeremy Corbyn must create it, <laughs> because if we wait for the Tories to do it, we'll be waiting for a very long time. <laughs> okay. We need, at the same time, a common social insurance basic income fund, and there are Tec technically speaking, all these issues, I'm not going to, to bore you much longer. Technically, we could put together such solutions in the context of a uniting, democratizing Europe within a few months. Technically, it is completely and utterly straightforward. The problem is the political process. And this is why we need DiEM25, because the way I conceptualize DiEM25 is another Europe is possible in 28 countries. So that's why we need to stick together and take what you've done here, what we're doing in Germany, what we're doing in Portugal. Yesterday I was in Dublin. We are setting up DiEM there. Um, in, we even have now a, a new branch, I found out, of 150 members in Belgrade. So we are spreading. And that is what we are trying to build. Thank you, Yanis, and thank you, everybody. Um, I gave him a bit more time because I felt like the room probably wanted it, and I hope that was okay. Um, uh, <laughs> not too much. Um, okay, we're going to open it out now. Uh, remember, um, what gives you hope? What should we build? You can go off a little, a little bit off-piste if you want to, but try and keep it to that. Um, and uh, Laura's going to help us. Microphone? Yeah, oh, great. Oh, um, so, we've got a few hands. Uh, the lady just down here. You. We'll take three at a time. <laughs> I'll try to. No, she's just asked me to cause trouble. Um, so, my name is Marlene, and I'm a proud member of Momentum with James. And I'm speaking the quest for a moment about uh, from a perspective of Momentum Black Connections, which is a group of black. Uh, communities that really are supporting Jeremy Corbyn and his values. My, you know, my hope is participating in this great movement to the left. But from a black perspective, there is a worry. In Britain, we've actually always been historically in a European context, more advanced in uh, creating equality rights and so on. And largely Europe has been behind. So we are very concerned from a black perspective about the position of the black communities in France and Germany and Italy and, and Belgium and so on. And my hope is that as we advance in this way, that there will be a greater increase of a diverse perspective so that we speak and we're representative in that way. Great. Thank you. Uh, I saw Janus speak last time when he's, he was a refugee from Greece at the time uh, in Westminster and I asked him at the end of his thing, I said, have you written anything on the basic citizen's income? And he said, not yet. And that gave me such hope. And since then he has started to write and to talk about it and that gives me more. And re I really feel things are changing because however good 
uh, uh, this state investment bank will be, we know when you have a centralised authority, it gathers power into itself. Now, at the beginning, there will be so many obvious things that haven't been done that will be for it to do. But over time, we do not want power in the hands of however good, however well-meaning, a small group of decision makers in the central bank. We want to have 70 million decision makers in Britain. We want to have 500 million decision makers in Europe. We want to have 7 billion decision makers in the world. And that can happen through a citizen's income. Now, if you want to, if you're interested, Janice, I've worked out all the details mathematically, <laughs> the best way of doing it. Great, you'll connect <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> But really, it, it, that, that gives me hope and change, and it's basically democratic parliamentary revolution. Exciting stuff. There's two ladies in front of you, just to the ladies in front of you. Uh, let's try and keep it short, everybody, so that we can hear as many voice, voices as possible. This is a great start. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, what gives me hope is things like participatory democracy, but I wonder, Mary, you were talking about structures of governance. How do we make sure that they really are democratic and include everybody and get rid of this appalling arrogance in this country that possession of a British passport somehow means that you are more equal than others because you aren't? We're, there's a lady next. I'm laying head I want to make a pluralistic plea, um, very similar to yours, Marlene. Um, uh, sorry if what I'm saying is slightly inchoate. It's very, very heartfelt. I have been the leading Green Party campaigner in Barnet for the last five years. I was on the ballot paper for every single election until the general election last year, when I was the only candidate offering social justice and environmental justice. Labour were nowhere on that agenda. Nowhere, okay? And, um, I mean, I failed to keep my deposit again. So, when Jeremy Corbyn was elected shortly after the general election and I was completely on the floor, I thought, wow, there's a little bit of hope here. But what I found was that Momentum, for example, is not welcoming. You are not, you are not talking about building a broad coalition and a pluralist coalition and a new politics. All you're saying, it seems to me, from looking at your information, is um, helping the Labour Party helping Jeremy Corbyn. I would like to make a plea, first of all, for a much more pluralistic movement that takes in Yanis and takes in us, and second of all, for a recognition that we need to change Westminster politics on the part of powerful movements such as Momentum. That is my plea. Thank you. Um, and we'll hear, we'll hear from James on that in a minute. I'm going to keep it. We want to hear from more people in the audience before we bring it back to the panel. Is that good? Um, there's a gentleman here. Thank you. Um, a quest you were in Dublin yesterday. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, uh, you, now, you may see where I'm coming from. Um, let's look at this uh, from, let's say, the simple tool of SWOT analysis. I, I, I hear, uh, just let's use, uh, apply this simple tool of SWOT analysis for a moment. Um, we're hearing about all the opportunities of a democratic Europe and a democratic Britain in a democratic Europe. What about the threats? What about the geopolitical reality uh, in which we function? Uh, what about uh, NATO? What about um, the ambitions of um, the people behind and the promoters of TTIP and TPPP and the exclusion of the BRICS? So, in brief, uh, could you address the threats as you see them to this uh, vision that we're trying to develop here? Okay, there's a gentleman just over there. Um. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Timothy Block. Um, what gives me hope is this lot. What gives, me, what gives me even more hope is there are so many young people here. Because it is for you that this referendum is so vital. I'll be dead and gone. What also gives me hope is I see Jeremy Corbyn as a window of opportunity. I uh, am too uh, in momentum. And to answer our green comrades, um, we need to be more pluralistic. And in fact, we had a momentum meeting last Thursday. I'm in the Wandsworth branch. And we are going to invite 
uh, a Green speaker, a Green member to come and speak to us. So we do need to be open to all, because it may just be that somebody in the Green Party has a good idea. <laughs> and I'm sure they do. But we have to listen. We have to listen to everybody. What else gives me hope is that Sadiq Khan has been elected Mayor of London because that, that is an example to Europe that we are a multinational country. I am slightly disappointed that we're not more ethnically um, broadened here. You know, if you look, you know, we need to, we need, you know, following our black comrade there, we need to have more ethnicity here. What we need to build, I personally believe, is momentum, an open momentum, to carry forward Jeremy Corbyn's policies into the Labour Party. We also need, and I, this is, uh, I've only heard about today's events from Caroline Lucas on the radio as I woke up, and I thought, bloody hell, if I can get my swim in first, I can then get there as well. <laughs> so I did do all that, so it's been a great Saturday and a delight to hear all you people, but we have to work together. Right. Unlike, unlike, unlike um, Mr. Trump, who wants to build a bloody great wall, I want to destroy all the walls. We are all human beings. This all sounds all right. a bit wanky, doesn't it? We're all human <laughs> beings, but we have to work together. Yeah. And the great difference, just great. two seconds, and the great danger is, we can see with the refugees, the crisis, that you suddenly get nationalism. You get the Macedonian border shutting. You get the other borders shutting. We have to keep them open. All right, lots of hands. Um, there's a... <clears throat> There's a young lady here. Um, hi, my name is Hur Patan. I'm 14 years old, I'm a youth political campaigner um, from Leicester. I've been campaigning for better youth engagement in politics since age of eight. I run my own project called Let's Talk About Politics. And um, last year, in the run up to general elections, I was also working with Ed Miliband on youth engagement. Um, what I hope to build is a pan European movement of young people, both at voting age and before it campaigning and holding politicians to account because I think that's the people who can't vote often go unnoticed and I think personally as a 14 year old I feel like my opinion doesn't matter as much as mm. someone who's 18 and can vote has like an opinion um, and my question is how can young people like me do this in Euro Europe how can we get involved and hold politicians to account and how can we get our views forward um, also, Yanis, uh, could I be really cheeky and ask to speak to you for two minutes after this session, please? <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a lady right behind you there. Uh, we're we're going to go down there. Um, on the 24th of June, there is, uh, there is a possibility that we'll be, be looking at a Brexit, um, which will be a colossal shock for the country and we all know what happens in shocks, we lose more control. Um, what I'm wondering is whether we stay in or out, uh, I'm, I'm, what I would like to build is the, and, and be part of is the momentum going forward now that we're, uh, and also um, arming ourselves for the possibility of that shock and talking about it now so that when it comes we just carry on, we don't stop. This is the reason to join together now. There's a gentleman there. Um, Asian gentleman. Thank you. What gives me hope um, are all the optimists in this campaign. I was a ferocious Eurosceptic and I was annoying all of my uh, Europhilic friends by uh, annoying them with my Eurosceptic arguments and they kept at it. They didn't stop. They kept with their positive campaigning. And uh, thank you, Yanis, as well, for finally tipping me over the edge because I wasn't decided to coming here. Now I'm definitely going to be voting for Remain. <laughs> I was very privileged last August to share a um, uh, stage with Jeremy Corbyn and one thing he said, I just want to finish, what, we, what can we build? Um, he said something at the end of his speech that really touched me and I'm glad that he, uh, he said that uh, in my city, Nottingham. He said, my friends, together we are very, very strong. Together we can achieve things. Together we can make a massive difference. So let's stay together for the long haul and achieve all of that and more and liberate the minds and attitudes of young and old alike to achieve that decent, better world. And that's what I want to build. Thank you. The lady with the crutch who's been very, very patient. Um... Uh, 
Um, I'm a housing campaigner in London. I'm also an NHS campaigner. And I can tell you that the one thing you need in London, if you're going to campaign on those two issues, is optimism. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't see a great deal of hope, I'm afraid. So I can't answer your question the way you want to. And one of the reasons that I can't, to come back to the very local level, is that I see at all levels of government, and I see it all the way through this country, and I see it all the way through Europe, is that the global corporations are no longer entities somewhere out there, the multinationals that we talked about in the 80s when Thatcher was, on, was, was running the country. What we're talking about now are representatives of the big four, E&Y, PwC, Deloitte's and KPMG, along with McKinsey and various others, who are basically the servants of the global corporations, who are embedded deeply in our civil society, that, it, that when you are in Brent, or if, like me, you're in Southwark, and you're trying to make changes, it is not your democratically elected representatives who are making the choices. It is the officers who are overruling those democratic representatives. And that, that is... That is deeply worrying, and I haven't heard anyone anywhere yet say how we go about changing that situation, because that's not just about who we elect. And what's more, although I am a great fan of both Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, personally, sorry, um, I um, am very, very concerned about the idea that we put our faith in two individuals who are in the middle of a Labour Party whose interests for the last 30 years have been more in line with the Tory party than with the people <laughs> in this room. Yeah, there's a lady right on the end there. And, and just to respond to that, I put my faith in rooms like this and people like the people in this room and all the people who aren't in this room who could be in this room and who we could connect with later. And I speak as somebody who was once a candidate for General Secretary of the Labour Party. The theory of change is us, not them. Um, Hi, <clears throat> my name's Annabelle and I'm a psychotherapist and I just want to put my hope in individuals' mental health because that hasn't been spoken about today. And Yanis talks about um, investment. Well, mental health and people collaborating and working together is an important part of that. I think people rebelling is an important part of their mental health because we face an epidemic of anxiety and loneliness in our society created to me by the lies of neoliberalism and telling people that they can buy their happiness when we can create it together. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we'll come to the back next. Good. Sorry. We'll go to the back next. Good, good point. I, I feel very awkward talking from the front now. But, um... <laughs> I, I want to come back on. Yep. 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 I'll, I'll do that afterwards. I just want to make my point first. Quickly. But um, I feel like coming back on the lady's point is that if we really want to democratise Europe, we can't just simply democratise the political systems because we live in a capitalist system where politics and economics are the same thing. The corporations are in many ways the same as the government and each affect the other. If we really want to democratise Europe, we have to democratise these big corporations as well. We have to take power from them as we take power from the governments because each of them are terrorising our own lives. Great. So, uh, we're we're going to go to the back. Um... We are not going to hear from everybody, but we'll hear from as many people as we can. Um, we're going to go to the back. That gentleman there. Thank you. Hang on. Hang on. Your moment has come. And, and keep it brief, because then more voices can be heard. We're, we're going to come back to the Indeed. panel in a minute. Um, I'm David Raby. I'm a Green Party city councillor in Norwich. Um, I'm also on the International Committee of the Green Party. Um, one of the things that inspired me uh, years ago was the 25th of April... Um, revolution of the Carnations in Portugal. And in Portugal today, as Sirio mentioned this morning briefly, no one talks about it, but there is a left anti-austerity government in Portugal, which is taking measures. It's not revolutionary, but it is doing positive things. And no one talks about it. We have to link up in a direct way with any movement, any, as was said, any local government, but also a national government, which is in fact taking positive measures to change things in Europe. Portugal is doing that. We should link up with them. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a lady right at the back there uh, with her hand up. 
Hello, um, my name is Kristen. Um, I I work um, in an international humanitarian agency, and I just came back yesterday from uh, Budapest, where I was meeting with colleagues from the Middle East um, and also from Eastern Europe who are working on the refugee issues. Social workers on the border of Serbia and Hungary that is now closed, where people are accumulating day by day. Social workers in the north of Jordan um, working with Syrian refugees and and other countries. And basically, um, what inspires me is people when I meet them and my colleagues who are from some of the countries and contexts where there's the worst oppressions, the worst wars, places like Gaza, Afghanistan, um, and that they are still able to keep working for their futures. But the thing that, dis that discouraged me and actually that depresses me the most is a contrast between peacekeeping and warmongering. And this is a question to everyone, but maybe to, to pick up what Mary said about, you know, the European's role in peacekeeping. Well, for me, there's, you know, the biggest threat to peace is a military industrial complex and the vested interests in these, 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 profit-making companies that basically thrive on war. So my question to everyone is, can we have peace as long as we have that profit? That's Thank a good you. question. There's a gentleman over here uh, with glasses who's had his hand up for a very long time. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, Asian gentleman with glasses. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Matthew Mahmoudi. I'm from Iran and Denmark, so a bit of a mess. Um, <laughs> What gives me hope is uh, the lady who was in this session before, uh, who was able to ask the question of what we're actually going to do as GN25 in Europe. I think it's important that we're able to address these issues and it is important that we're able to address this group of people. What I also think is very important that we should build, which I think we should address more, is how we're going to build inclusion, particularly because the narrative that we use uh, especially on the left, might seem elitist uh, to some extent, and we need to include. And my question is, how are we able to build more inclusion? How are we able to disseminate that across a variety of different sociocultural and socioeconomic backgrounds? Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman just up here. Yep. Uh, hello, uh, my name's Ian, I'm from South London Sea and Essex, which is uh, a hotbed of Euroscepticism. And uh, I have to uh, nail my colours to the, um, the traditional view of the left in the Labour Party, as espoused by Tony Benn, that the uh, European Union is an unreformable, unreformable neoliberal club. Now, there's been a lot of talk of uh, another Europe is possible, but we have to recognise that on the basis of the European Union constituted on the Rome, Maastricht and Lib Lisbon treaties, that is not possible. Now, there's lots of arguments about um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to leave, whether we open ourselves up to living in a fascist state. I think that is a very pessimistic point of view because it overlooks the role of the progressive labour and trade union movement, which would fight back against any uh, Johnson Gove uh, insurgency. And I think ultimately it's got to, we have to have the faith. And I, I, I look to the, 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 as I say, to the views of Tony Benn. Let's keep the faith. Let's leave the European Union and work for a new one. That is the only way that we will get hope. Build a new movement, be it DM25, be it a socialist movement. But that, that's the way forward. Let's break with the capitalist club. And Thank even you. in this room, I think that is a very legitimate opinion, which we should all take very seriously. If we vote out, and I think there's a bloody good chance we will, then we need to fight a different way. Uh, my own view is that we should try to stay in and change it from the inside. Um, we are over time now. I'm going, I'm sorry. Can I have hope? Two Can you, we, our, our, our facilitator is going to have hope for two seconds, and I think that's very fair. What gives me hope is breakfast. Um, and that's because I sit at breakfast in my uh, house in Italy with my Italian husband, who I met in Bulgaria, before we moved to Romania, wondering when we're going to next see our Spanish nurse. How am I going to leave the European Union? It's a nonsense. We are Europe. Look at us. I mean, one of us is genetically apparently European as well, which I'm <laughs> looking forward to hearing a little bit more about afterwards. Um, w the leaving is actually an impossibility. And, and it's the concept of Europe that we need to hang on to. And the European Union institutions must not distract us from that because they are two very, very different things. So what gives me hope is that we are brave enough to say, don't be sunk by the EU institutions. And I used to work for the European Commission. It was a horrendous place. Don't be sunk by that. That's a narrow view of the world. The big positive vision of Europe and European citizens. And that's what gives the lady with the microphone hope. Thank you.
OK, I, I can't... It was a wonderful debate, but I can't possibly answer all the questions. So I just want to focus on two which were really addressed at me. One is about democracy, and the other is about geopolitical realities and the military-industrial complex. <laughs> yeah, at Ukraine too. So... Um, so on democracy, just one proposal, and it relates to the issue of black communities, that's something I've always been very keen on, a little proposal that we could campaign for. At the moment, European citizenship is based on nationality. You get to be a European citizen if you're a British citizen. You get to be a British citizen, a European citizen, if you're a British citizen or an Italian citizen. Why not call for European citizenship based on residency, which would immediately empower many of the stateless people that are in many European countries? That's just a simple suggestion. Um, and on democratic structures, I just want to emphasize what I said and what Yanis also said. There's such a thing in the European Union called subsidiarity, which says the decisions uh, should be closest to the citizen. It doesn't work that way, but that's what I think if you're going to reclaim democracy. The decisions, the important decisions that you take should be taken at the level closest to you, which could be the town, the region. And that's only possible if you have the kind of structures Yanis was talking about at a European level that make it possible for you to have the, take those decisions that do something about multinationals, about the financial market and all these other things. So that's on democratic structures. On geopolitical realities, every time we deal with threats in a traditional geopolitical way, okay, so Russia's in Ukraine and has taken Crimea, strengthening NATO is just gonna make all that worse. It plays into Putin's narrative. It, um, it plays into the arms race, and actually it makes things worse. Having airstrikes against ISIL doesn't deal with the problem of ISIL. It actually recruits more people to the cause. <laughs> the same with strengthening borders on the migrant. All of these traditional geo... The more you strengthen borders, all it does is to make it more difficult and dangerous for migrants, and it doesn't stop the criminals or the terrorists who always will get across borders. So we've got to stop thinking in geopolitical terms. And because the EU is a multilateral organization, it's much less based on geopolitical thinking because the military... And I couldn't agree more with the person about the military-industrial complex. I think at the moment, the sort of integration of the American and the British and the Israeli industries is really shaping uh, defense policies. But the EU doesn't have the same degree of military... Of course, there are defense industries in the EU, but that kind of deeply embedded military-industrial complex doesn't exist. So the more we go to that level, the more... We, and, and my view is that escaping geopolitical realities is the only way we can solve the big problems we face from refugees to terrorism to organized crime. So it's terribly, terribly important. And let's not forget, as Caroline Lucas has been reminding us, that the European Union began as a peace project. Mm -hmm. I was very involved in the anti-nuclear movement and the anti-Cold War movement, and it was all about creating Europe as a peace project. That's what yeah. it was about. And, um, well, that... And finally, yes, one point. This referendum <laughs> is not about leaving the EU or staying in the EU. It's about nationalism versus cosmopolitanism. It's about racism. It's about worldviews. And that's, it's just so important that we hold mm. to a cosmopolitan worldview. Yeah. <laughs> James. That was a, there's way too much to respond to, and I would have liked to just sit here and listen to everyone else speak for another hour, but I, I also need the bathroom, so maybe not. Um, to respond to the, that 
specific um, question. We do need a more pluralist politics, and we do need a far more participatory politics and a more participatory uh, economy. We need a more democratic economy, a more democratic society, a more democratic politics. And there needs to be a lot of organizations that do that. The Green Party needs to do that. Lots of other organizations need to work for that end. Momentum tries to do that in two different ways. One, it tries to build a united, diverse movement outside of Westminster, outside of tr uh, traditional politics, in order to change it from the outside, helping people to get organized, helping campaigns that already exist to be stronger so that we can change politics from the outside. But also we have this, uh, the same political strategy as Jeremy Corbyn, which is in the Labour Party. And we need to work within the Labour Party, which we can't do effectively if there are other parties that are part of our organising structure. That doesn't mean we can't work with other parties. It doesn't mean they can't be part of our broader movement. But in order to work to change the Labour Party, to make it more open, to make it more democratic, to give it the kind of politics and policies that we'd all like to see, that's, that's what we need to do. So, I mean, whether you, whatever political party you're in or none, that is not the, the most important thing. The most important thing is that you are politically active and helping other people to do so. Helping people to get involved in migrants' rights organisations with, with their housing campaigns, with, uh, with political parties, with another Europe is possible. Again, I'm going to say it again, when you get to the uh, practical organising sessions at the end, please commit to something. Help other people to commit to something. Plan together, organise together, because as our um, friends in the Spanish left say, together we can. <laughs> Zoe. Thank you. Well, as everyone said, we had so much great discussion and I feel like I can't possibly respond to everybody, but um, I, I, I knew it would happen and of course I do agree very much with what Mary said today. Um, but I do want to address uh, this, this sort of idealism idea because I, I mean it's good that we are idealistic, that we have this positive vision, that we believe that something else is possible, that's great. But I'm not really an idealist when it comes to, to my day job, what I work on all the time, when it comes to migration and refugees. I'm a cold hard realist and there is, uh, as, as our friend at the back pointed out, there, there are wars that have, they are going to continue much as we may oppose them on a political level because on an economic level they, there are interests at stake that will keep them going and there are other things as well that economic interests in numerous industries which are forcing the advancement of climate change despite the fact that all politicians will come together and just say, oh yeah, we think it's bad and we should work against it and we should move towards renewables. It's not happening fast enough because of those economic interests. And so climate change and war and uh, repression worldwide is going to continue and that will force the continued movement of people because human beings are not cattle who go where you tell them. And you can't lock them up forever and you can't build a fence high enough to make them disappear. They continue to move and that is the reality. And I think that that will be th this migration issue, which has been brought up time and again, Again, that this referendum really does come down to whether or not you hate foreigners. Um, it does. That migration issue is going to force this critical moment and it's not going to go away. And the realist solution, not the idealist solution, the realist solution is to find ways of working together, of treating all people across the EU and beyond as human beings and of working together as people and overthrowing that power that otherwise will continue to destroy our world. And I hope that we can keep building that together. I don't have all the answers, but um, that's the only way. It's the only realistic way of moving forward. Thank you, Zoe. Yanis, finally. Four points, quick ones, and a plea with which to finish. The first point is uh, in response to what our friend from Essex said, uh, in reference to Tony Benn as well. Um, one of the first political campaigns I ever got involved in, as a very young person, was against Greece's accession to the European Union in the 1970s. Have I changed my mind? No. Because what has ha happened is Europe has changed since then. It's one thing to say you shouldn't get in in 1975, in 1979, in 1980, as in the case of Greece. It's quite another to say we should get out now. So even though I agreed with Tony Benn entirely in, when he ran his campaign against uh, the, the, the European Common Market then, back then, now I don't believe he would even agree with that. I think that he would be on our side. Why? Let me explain why. The dissolution, the disintegration, the collapse of this European Union with all its demerits and faults, uh, 
is going to create a deflationary vortex in the center of Europe, which is going to consume all progressives and is going to, fill, uh, to uh, reinforce the Le Pens, the Golden Dawns, and the UKIPs. It is not going to create a stronger labor movement that is going to oppose the Boris Johnson government. It is not going to revive the French left or the Italian left or the Greek left. It's going to consume all of us. And this is why I propose an alternative to exit governmental disobedience within the European Union. <laughs> You see, this, this question connect, connects with what uh, our black comrade said before about her concern regarding civil liberties and black rights in the rest of Europe. This kind of disintegration of the European Union will be utterly detrimental to black communities, to gay communities, to lesbian communities, to transgender communities throughout the European Union. The first move of the neo-fascist forces in Greece that were in power before they were in government in 2012 was to attack women on the streets, black migrant women, transgender people, and to attack them viciously and in a way that if I were to describe to you now, you wouldn't even believe. But I'm not going to do it because I will have something else to say immediately after that. Um, I've got my electronic notes here. Um, there was another question that really struck me as particularly significant uh, by the pessimist in our midst who said that all this is good, good and fine except that in the, the, the very fiber of civil society you have embedded the big four that effectively what are they doing? What are they doing? They're on behalf of transnational capital. They're milking economic rents from effectively the social welfare system. Yep. and from privatization and so on and so forth. And that is something that should be at the top of our, um, uh, of our mind in planning a better future, not just for Europe, but for any kind of capitalist society which is transforming in this way. A bit of um, optimism. Where the left has failed in the last hundred years, the technologies that capitalism is producing may succeed. <laughs> in the sense that they latest technological gadgets and processes give rise to some hope, no guarantees, that the corporate structure is being disrupted and is being undermined from within. The question is, what follows? Because something really nasty is going, may follow. Some kind of totalitarian regime or system of property rights to succeed the corporate one. Uh, and it's only a process of democratization that can create the political um, oeuvre of, on the left, on the progressive side, that, we, that, that, that might utilize these new technologies in the, in the right direction. And last, lastly, this process of focusing on what needs to be done at a continental scale, not just what needs to be done in our city and in our country this decentralized Europeanization as I conceptualize it, is very important because, let's face it, the British Constitution sucks. <laughs> <laughs> the European Constitution doesn't exist. Yeah? But here is the opportunity. In thinking of what the European Constitution should be, we are given an opportunity to rethink our own constitutions and to develop new processes for creating the rules of governance, the con new constitutions at the level of England, Scotland, Britain, and the European Union, that effectively shape the ground on which democratic politics can breathe more easily. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, we started a little late, we f we're going to finish a little late, but thank you to everybody, those who spoke, those who listened most of all, and to all of you for being here. I want to say one thing in conclusion. This is not David Cameron's referendum. This is not Nigel Farage's referendum. This is not Boris Johnson's referendum. 
This is not even Jeremy Corbyn's referendum. This is your referendum. This is our referendum. This is our country. This is our democracy. Let's get stuck in. One plea which I forgot to deliver, since this is a DM event. May I invite you to visit our website, DiEM25, and sign the Transparency in Europe campaign. And if you want, read the manifesto. And if you like the manifesto, join us. And apologies to anybody who I didn't get to. I was doing my best.